There are two types of cardiac muscle cells involved in a normal heartbeat. Contractile cells, which produce the powerful contractions that propel blood, and specialized non-contractile muscle cells of the conducting system, which I'll tell you about in a couple of slides. These non-contractile muscle cells control and coordinate the activities of the contractile cells. So these contractile cells form the bulk of the heart's muscle tissue, about 99%. What happens is an action potential in a ventricular contractile cell proceeds in three steps, which is pictured here. The first step is a rapid depolarization due to sodium ion influx. Then you have this plateau, labeled number two. It's mostly due to sodium pumping out and calcium influx, both extracellular calcium and sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium. And this plateau is showing how, in cardiac muscle cells, there's a delay in repolarization and this continued, continued contraction. And then the third step is repolarization, again, due to calcium channels closing, potassium channels opening, and potassium efflux out of the cell. So when you compare cardiac action potentials and muscle cell contractions to skeletal, um, there's quite a bit of difference. Skeletal muscle action potentials last about 10 milliseconds, whereas cardiac contractile cells action potentials last 250 to 300 milliseconds. It's quite a bit longer, much more sustained. And as with all muscle t tissue, until membrane repolarizes, it can't respond to another stimulus. The refractory period shown highlighted in blue in these pictures is is very very short in skeletal muscle tissue and the idea with a short refractory period in skeletal muscle tissues is that twitches can build upon each other to reach that sustained peak which we call tetanus whereas the extended action potential in cardiac contractile cells shown in the bottom two figures is going to extend that refractory period that blue section and that's going to limit the number of contractions per minute and so this makes tetanus impossible in cardiac contractile cells. Because really, a heart that's in tetanus can't pump blood, and that's the sole purpose of the heart. Unlike skeletal muscles, cardiac muscle tissue can contract independently of neural or hormonal stimulation. And this is called automasticity or autorhythmicity. Cardiac contractions are coordinated by the heart's conducting system, which I alluded to earlier. And this is a network made up of nodal cells and conducting cells. Nodal cells establish the rate of cardiac contraction and are located at the sinoatrial and atrioventricular nodes. Conducting cells are then going to distribute the contractile stimulus to the general myocardium. Conducting cells are those in the AV bundle, the bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers. Nodal cells are unusual because their plasma membranes can depolarize spontaneously and they generate an action potential at a regular interval. The nodal cells that reach the threshold first are called pacemaker cells and they're located in the sinoatrial node. And this is going to ensure that the atria contract together and that the atria contract prior to the ventricles and that the ventricles contract together and form the apex towards the base. The AV node can depolarize spontaneously. However, the cells in the AV node are typically stimulated by the SA node first. So this is kind of like a backup system. If the SA node fails, then the AV node can take over, but it generates an action potential at a slower rate. So from the AV node, the action potential travels to the AV bundle and along the interventricular septum to divide into the right and left bundle branches, where they branch into the Purkinje fibers, which conveys the impulse to the myocardium. The action potential then spreads across the heart in cell-to-cell -cell contact. So each time the heart beats, a wave of depolarization radiates through the atria, 
it reaches the AV node, travels down the interventricular septum to the apex, turns and then spreads through the ventricular myocardium towards the base. The electrical events occurring in the heart are powerful enough to be detected by electrodes placed on the body surface. And a recording of these events is an electrocardiogram, or ECG. These ECGs can be used to diagnose cardiac arrhythmias or a normal cardiac activity. So on the electrocardiogram, we have a number of peaks that are labeled P, Q, R, S, and T. The P wave indicates atrial depolarization. The QRS complex indicates ventricular depolarization. And hidden behind the QRS complex is the atrial repolarization. The T wave is going to indicate ventricle repolarization. The times between waves are segments. Intervals include a segment and at least one wave. So the PR interval occurs when an impulse is traveling from the SA node to the AV node. And the QT interval indicates the time required for the ventricular depolarization and repolarization. We've reached a checkpoint. So pause the recording and see if you can answer these questions. The next section looks at the cardiac cycle. And this is the period between the start of one heartbeat and the start of the next. It includes alternating periods of contraction, systole, and relaxation, diastole. And blood flows due to increases in pressures in one chamber above the pressures in the next chamber. And so this figure is depicting what happens in the cardiac cycle. It starts with an atrial systole where the atria contract. Now notice that the AV valves are open at this point. And there's active ventricular filling. When the atrial systole ends, the atrial diastole begins. And this happens along with earlier first phase of ventricular systole. At this point, the AV valve shut and the semilunar valves are still closed due to the lower artery pressure and the volume in the ventricles doesn't change. We then enter the next phase, or the second phase, where we have ejection phase of the ventricular systole. So the second phase of that ventricular systole, where the pressure in the ventricles rises high enough that it can actually push open the semilunar valves, and blood can be ejected from the ventricles. The last portion of the cardiac cycle is ventricular diastole, which also has two phases. In the early diastole, the semilunar valves are going to close. The AV valve is still closed. And once ventricular pressure drops below atrial pressure, the AV valves open. In the late ventricular diastole, passive ventricular filling occurs. And you can use a stethoscope to hear heart sounds. And these heart sounds are typically associated with the valves closing. So the first sound is a lub, and that's typically due to the atrioventricular valves closing. The second sound described as a dub is due to the semilunar valves closing. Um, if you're very acute at hearing these heart sounds, you may be able to detect a third and fourth heart sound. These are very faint, but you can hear atrial contraction and blood flow into the ventricles. And so we reached another checkpoint, but before we get to that, I want to show you one more, one more animation of the cardiac cycle. Expelled. 
valve, the atrioventricular or AV valves open. This allows blood to begin to flow into the ventricles from the atria. At the same time, the pulmonary and aortic valves are closed, preventing blood in the pulmonary trunk and aorta from entering the ventricles. Ventricular filling is completed by atrial systole or contraction. This contraction results from a series of events beginning with the spread of action potentials from the sinuatrial or SA node across the walls of the atria. This results in atrial depolarization, which is represented by the P wave on the electrocardiogram, also called an ECG or EKG. Atrial depolarization initiates contraction or systole. Atrial systole is represented by the PQ segment on the ECG. Near the end of atrial systole, impulses from the SA node reach the AV node. At this time, impulses spread from the AV node along the ventricular conduction fibers to the walls of the ventricles. This results in ventricular depolarization, which is represented by the QRS complex on the ECG. The atria repolarize, the walls relax and they remain in diastole for the rest of the cardiac cycle. Atrial repolarization is not seen on an ECG because it is masked by the QRS complex. In ventricular systole, or contraction, increased pressure in the ventricles forces the AV valves closed. The heart sound associated with the closure of the AV valves is known as S1, often described as LUB. With continued contraction, ventricular pressures increase until they are higher than those in the pulmonary trunk and aorta. At this point, the pulmonary and aortic valves open and blood is ejected from the ventricles. Ventricular systole is represented by the ST segment on the ECG. In ventricular diastole, or relaxation, the ventricles repolarize. The T wave on an ECG represents ventricular repolarization. Ventricular relaxation results in decreasing ventricular pressure. During ventricular diastole, blood in the pulmonary trunk and aorta flows back toward the semilunar valves, causing them to close. The heart sound associated with closure of the aortic and pulmonary valves is known as S2, often described as dub. After the aortic and pulmonary valves close, pressure in the ventricles continues to decrease. When intraventricular pressure falls below the pressure in the atria, the AV valves open and the cardiac cycle begins again. I like that animation. It really does a nice job of summarizing that whole section that we were just discussing. The last section takes a look at heart dynamics. And the term heart dynamics refers to the movement and forces generated during cardiac cycle contractions. The amount of blood ejected by a ventricle during a single beat is the stroke volume. But this can vary from beat to beat, so cardiac output is a more valuable term, more valuable number. Cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped by the left ventricle in one minute. So cardiac output provides an indication of the blood flow through peripheral tissues. It can be calculated by multiplying the heart rate by the average stroke volume. Cardiac output is precisely regulated so that peripheral tissues receive an adequate blood supply under a variety of conditions. The major factors that regulate cardiac output include blood volume reflexes, autonomic innervation, and hormones. We're going to look at each one of those. Starting with blood volume reflexes. While a cardiac muscle contraction is an active process, relaxation is entirely passive and is provided by blood pouring into the heart. This is aided by the elasticity of the cardiac skeleton. And as a result, there is a direct relationship between the amount of blood entering the heart and the amount of blood ejected during the next contraction. One important heart reflex that responds to changes in blood volume is the atrial reflex. 
which adjusts heart rate in response to an increase in the venous return. The entry of blood stimulates a stretch receptors that are in the right atrial walls, and this triggers an increase in heart rate through sympathetic activity. So even though the pacemaker cells of the SA node establish the basic heart rate, they can still be influenced by the autonomic nervous system. The heart has dual innervation of the SA and the AV nodes, as well as the atrial and ventricular cardiac muscle cells. You can see parasympathetic innervation by the vagus nerve and sympathetic fibers that extend from the cervical and upper thoracic ganglia. Autonomic effects on heart rate primarily reflect the responses of the SA node to acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Acetylcholine is released by parasympathetic motor neurons, which lower the heart rate. Norepinephrine is released by the sympathetic neurons, which increase heart rate. A sustained increase in heart rate follows the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine by the adrenal medulla during sympathetic activation. The autonomic nervous system also affects stroke volume, the sympathetic release of norepinephrine at synapses in the myocardium, and the release of norepinephrine and epinephrine by the adrenal medulla stimulate cardiac muscle cell metabolism and increase the force and degree of the ventricular contraction. The result is an increased stroke volume. The primary effect of parasympathetic acetylcholine release is inhibition. This results in a decrease in force of cardiac contractions. The greatest result occurs in the atria. The ventricular myocardium has very limited cholinergic receptors. The cardiac centers of the medulla oblongata contain the autonomic headquarters for cardiac control. The cardioaccelatory center controls sympathetic motor neurons that increase heart rate. And the nearby cardioinhibitory center controls the parasympathetic motor neurons that slow heart rate. Sensory information concerning the status of the cardiovascular system arrives at the cardiac centers via the vagus nerves and from the sympathetic nerves of the cardio cardiac plexus. The cardiac centers can be influenced by higher brain centers, especially the hypothalamus, which explains why changes in emotional state can have an impact on heart rate. And as mentioned, the epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal medulla does increase heart rate and stroke volume, but also thyroid hormones and glucagon can increase the stroke volume from the heart as well. And that concludes the lecture on Chapter 12 of the Heart.